Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar where I will be discussing the Thomas R. Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellowship Program. My name is Dr. Lily Lopez McGee. My apologies for that little mix up, um, some technical glitches. Um, welcome, we're gonna try again. So my name is Dr. Lily Lopez McGee and I am the director for the Thomas R. Pickering Foreign Affairs Fellowship and I'm happy to be here with you today to talk a little bit about the program, both in terms of um, how to apply and get involved with the program as well as uh, the individual components that make up the two and a half year program um, that our fellows pursue. So just a little bit of background about the program. The Pickering program began in 1994 as a way to encourage and promote excellence and diversity in the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service. The program is currently administered by Howard University and is a State Department funded program. So we work in collaboration with the folks over at the Department of State and work um, really hard to, to make sure that our fellows are um, prepared and ready to go into the Foreign Service, which the program culminates in a career with the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service um, after fellows complete all of the requirements of the program. So it's I'll, I'll do just a quick brief overview of the, the different um, components of the program, and then I'll walk through each of the individual components in the application process itself. So the fellowship is a um, is a graduate level fellowship that provides up to $37,500 of funding for each year towards a two year graduate program, a uh, graduate degree in, a, in an area of relevance to the US Department of State's Foreign Service at a US based institution. So do you have to check off all of those boxes when I describe um, the, the program? Um, the, graduate fellow, the graduate fellowship can um, support um, two-year professional degrees, essentially in areas such as public administration, public policy, business administration, international affairs, economics, and any of those types of degrees that have a direct relevance to the U.S. Department of State's Foreign Service. And I'll talk a little bit more later about um, what types of programs those look like specifically. Our fellows uh, begin their their experience with the Pickering Fellowship with a week-long intensive orientation um, to the Department of State and the Foreign Service in mid-June. And then they begin their graduate studies at a program of their choice, um, as long as it's in line with the requirements of the fellowship. They participate in a 10-week internship at the Department of State in Washington, D.C. in between their first and second year of graduate school. And then they do a 10-week overseas internship at a U.S. consulate or embassy after having completed their master's degree. Um, the program also provides wraparound mentorship um, where we pair fellows with a senior foreign service officer as well as a um, program sponsor, a an, an, uh, younger entry-level um, a younger professional, career professional, uh, foreign service officer um, in the department so that they have um, folks who have gone through the program as well as senior folks um, who can speak more to the career aspects of, of um, the life as life as a foreign service officer. And then the program culminates in employment with the Department of State's um, Foreign Service. Um, there is a five-year service commitment and this is dependent on um, fellows completing all of the different components and meeting the basic entry requirements in accordance with the State Department policy. So a little bit about the eligibility requirements for the program. Um, because this is a hiring pipeline for the Department of State, we are looking for individuals who have U.S. citizenship. Um, we will ask for proof of citizenship at the, at the time uh, that you apply to the program. If you are currently um, in the process of obtaining your citizenship, you must have your citizenship in hand by the deadline. And this year's deadline is September 17th. You have to have a cumulative GPA of a 3.2 on a, on a 4.0 scale, which essentially means um, that we will be looking at your undergraduate transcripts and all of the transcripts of the institutions that you've attended. 
um, to determine this GPA. If your undergraduate, um, if the, the place where you got your undergraduate degree does not have a 3.2 GPA, let's say you had a 3.15 um, at your home institution, um, but you spent two years at a junior, at, at a community college um, obtaining your associate's degree and your GPA was above the 3.2 um, threshold. We would do a cumulative GPA to determine whether or not um, your combined GPA between your undergraduate coursework and your community college coursework um, uh, met the 3.2 GPA uh, um, threshold. So we are, if you have questions about whether or not your GPA meets those requirements, please email us and we are happy to calculate and help you work through that. Um, you must also We'll be seeking enrollment at a two-year master's program in the fall of 2020. So for this year's application, cycled application currently is open and will be open until September 17th of, um, of this fall. And uh, we are looking for folks who will plan to enroll in their graduate studies next fall. So you are essentially applying a year in advance. Uh, of when you anticipate going to, to graduate school. At the time of application, you don't have to know where you're going to school, but you do have to tell us where you plan to apply. So a little bit about the timeline for, for this year's application cycle. Um, the application is currently live and available, apply.pickeringfellowship.org. Um, the application will close on September 17th. In Late October, around the 25th of October, we will notify 60 finalists that they have been invited to Washington, D.C. to interview. Over the course of two days on November 6th and 7th, we will our selection panels will interview those 60 finalists. And immediately following those two days of interviews, are, we will notify the 30 selected participants as to whether or not they received um, the award. Um, our, uh, the 30 fellows who are selected will have uh, approximately five days to decide whether or not they want to accept the award. Um, often the question here that we get um, is whether or not folks can apply to both the Pickering and the Wrangell Fellowship Program, and you can. Um, our timeline runs, both of the programs have similar timelines. The deadline for the Wrangell application is a week following ours, um, and they will do their interviews two weeks following our interviews in November. Um, and uh, you can hypothetically be uh, confirmed as a finalist for both programs um, because the selection processes are completely separate and our selection committees are different people. Um, so if in the case that an individual is selected for both to interview for both programs, um, comes in to interview with us and receives the Pickering Award, they would have to either accept or decline the award. And if they decline, then they would go on to interview for the Wrangell program. However, if they decided not to, uh, if they did not receive the Wrangell Award, they could not come back and get the Pickering Fellowship Award. Um, but in the same vein, if you're not accepted to the Pickering program and you were invited to interview for the Wrangell program, you would still plan to come back two weeks later in November to interview for the Wrangell program. Um, and then uh, the orientation that our fellows go through will be in uh, mid-June, of early June of 2020. So a little bit about how the funding breaks down for the fellowship. Um, I mentioned the 30, 37500 per year towards a two-year master's program. We will provide up to 21500 per year for towards tuition and mandatory fees, um, in addition to an additional $16,000 towards uh, uh, living, living expenses that goes directly to the fellow. Um, this is per year. Um, so... In, as you're looking at where you'd like to attend uh, graduate school, this is an area where we um, like to encourage folks to think about all of the different um, types of programs that are out there, um, how much it costs to go to school and that kind of thing. Our program partners with a number of different graduate institutions. I think our partners list is approaching 40 different institutions um, that have committed to providing additional support to Pickering Fellows for their time in the program. The list is located on our website. Um, if you're interested in knowing a, more about the specific offers for each program, um, shoot us an email and we'll send you that offer list. Um, that funding um, can, you know, just to kind of go in on this point about the cost of, of graduate school, um, the, the 37500 sounds like a really, ro uh, really robust award at first, at first glance. Um, but then you look at some of the graduate 
programs and how, how much the cost of attendance might be. And some of them are upwards of sixty and seventy thousand dollars per year. So the twenty one thousand five hundred towards tuition doesn't seem as as great um, anymore. So we like to encourage folks to think about all of the different types of programs that are out there. If you're a Latin Americanist, for example, and you really want to um, study Latin American policy, um, the U University of Texas at Austin provides a really um, a really robust uh, financial aid package to Pickering Fellows uh, to complement the award that we're providing. If you're interested in East Asian affairs and you are really interested in the um, studying that region, um, the University of Washington's Jackson School um, and the University of San Diego's, uh, during the University of California in San Diego, also provide really robust um, funding opportunities where you could potentially get all of the tuition covered um, for the four-year, two-year master's program. Um, so again, depending on what your areas of interest are, we would definitely encourage you to think a little bit more about how to, uh, uh, about your interests and aligning them with the uh, the funding award for the for the Pickering program. I did mention the, the um, 40, or so, 40 or so part or institutions. Um, you, our fellows are not required to attend those institutions. Those are simply ones that have provided um, an additional commitment to Pickering Fellows. You can take your funding to other programs, though again we would have to, the staff at the program would have to approve those um, those programs before uh, before you accept any offers to other, other programs. If you have a question about a specific program that is not listed on our, our partners list, shoot us an email and we're happy to go through the curriculum to let you know whether or not that program aligns with what we would fund. Um, in addition to the funding that you receive for your graduate program, um, we also provide up to $10,000 um, for the two summer internships, the domestic internship and the overseas internship. Um, we provide a living stipend on top of providing um, a funding for housing in at your domestic internship in Washington, D.C. And then um, fellows do receive housing at post when they do their overseas internship. We will also provide funding for uh, travel to and from um, Washington, D.C. and your overseas location, as, um, as well as uh, the cost of vaccinations, inoculations, insurance for the time that you are um, at your overseas post. So it is uh, uh, a very good opportunity to get work experience and um, have the the sustenance to to uh, to make it see it through those ten weeks. Um, in addition to the funding, we also have lots of professional development opportunities and mentorship um, that our fellows receive throughout the course of the program. I didn't mention the mentors, um, but during that summer that our fellows are here in Washington D.C., we also go really deep into different professional development and skills building workshops. We'll spend lots of time talking about the importance of writing and actually getting writing in uh, into your, uh, how to write in the foreign service um, because it is different from writing in graduate school, for example. Um, we will also bring in um, current foreign service officers and fellows to talk about um, uh, how to prepare for entering the, the, the foreign service, and again, other skills um, that, that are uh, really important to, to our foreign service officers. So with great benefits also be, uh, come great um, ob obligations and requirements. So I, I did mention that in order to um, get in and to be able to serve uh, that five-year service obligation um, after having completed the, the two-year master's program and the internships. Um, our fellows do also have to meet the, the basic entry requirements that all foreign service officers do, um, which means obtaining and maintaining a medical security and suitability clearance. Um, all three of those are um, are required in order to uh, to become a foreign service officer and as such our fellows are required to obtain those as well. Um, the minute that we uh, send out the offer awards to the 30 fellows who are selected during that year, um, we will begin the security clearance process. And essentially the security clearance process is, can you keep a secret? Are you able um, to maintain classified information um, that you would likely come into contact with as a foreign service officer? Um, our fellows have to get top secret security clearance. Um, and oftentimes the areas that, that, um, that become problematic um, are kind of fall in a, into a couple of camps. And we do have a resource on our website that outlines in uh, much greater detail what is required for obtaining and maintaining the clearances. And I would encourage you to read that. Um, you'll notice that our application has a, a, a pretty lengthy statement at the beginning of it that requires you to, to uh, confirm 
um, that that you're agreeing to going through this process. So I would encourage you to think long and hard about um, whether or not the you you would be able to obtain and maintain these clearances. So back to what some of the um, the barriers have traditionally been. Um, usually, um, we find that drug use is a really big one. So if you have used um, marijuana in the past. Um, that could be a really big issue. It is legal in lots of different states around the country, but it is still considered a, a class one federal offense. Um, and that could prevent you from um, obtaining your security clearance. Um, so general, general uh, rule of thumb is wait at least a year before you apply to the program since you last used, though the more time in between the last time you've used and the time that you're going through the security uh, clearance process is better. Um, in general. The other area is financial management. It's not necessarily that you couldn't have debt. Everybody has debt. I have debt. Everyone has some level of debt, student loans, mortgages, that kind of thing. That's not inherently um, a flag. What becomes um, challenging is your ma management of that debt. Um, so our diplomatic security will look at different um, ways that you've managed debt, uh, whether or not you have uh, made progress towards paying um, loans, whether or not you've been in contact with folks um, about managing any types of loans or services that you have uh, that you have in your name. Um, so general uh, suggestion, take a look at your credit score. Um, take a look at your credit report. See if there are any things that are popping up um, that might be issues and start taking care of those even before you finish your application. It can be really helpful to um, to preemptively go through that in, um, before going through this, this um, before getting to the point where you're applying to the program. Um, in addition to the, the security clearance, um, we also have medical clearances. Um, so our fellows do have to obtain a class one medical clearance where you're able to serve around the world. Um, it there are not, um, medical cases are very much subject to, to a case by case basis. There's no one um, rule that is across the board, something that will prevent you from obtaining a medical clearance. And um, I will say that, that just in, in general, um, having a chronic illness or um, any, any type of uh, uh, issue that you might have to manage is not inherently going to prevent you from getting a medical clearance. Um, it's uh, how you can uh, manage it while you're serving overseas. Because again, our foreign service officers have to be worldwide available. Um, the suitability clearance is a little bit interesting. It's different um, than any other clearance process that you might go through. Um, it's unique to the State Department Foreign Service because our fellows and all Foreign Service officers will become um, U.S. diplomats with diplomatic secure, uh, immunity when they're serving overseas. Um, the suitability clearance is really looking at whether or not you are able to represent the United States interests overseas um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because as Foreign Service officers, you never really are off the job um, when you are serving overseas. Um, so uh, some of the things that might come up in that might be challenging in the security clearance process could also be issues in the suitability clearance. If you have questions about any of those things that I've mentioned, um, again, feel free to reach out to us at any point. We're happy to walk through and ask, answer any individual uh, questions about, uh, about the clearance process. In addition to the clearances, our fellows also have to maintain a 3.2 GPA throughout their program um, during the time that they're in graduate school. You will also have to meet the State Department Foreign Service entry requirements. So our fellows do have to take the Foreign Service Officer written exam. You don't have to pass it, you do have to take it. Um, and they must take and pass the Foreign Service Oral Assessment exam. Um, and our fellows are given the opportunity to take those um, multiple times over the course of their seven years with the program. So the two years in graduate school and the five year service commitment. Um, all of our fellows are required to take the Foreign Service Officer Oral Assessment at least once before they enter the service. Um, and then we do have the five year service obligation that begins as soon as you start your A100, which is that six week in, um, intensive orientation that happens for all uh, Foreign Service Officers. So let's talk a little bit about um, graduate school and some of the things that we look for in approving graduate um, programs. Um, so all of our fellows are attending two-year master's programs. They do have to be US-based institutions and they must be in-person programs. So we can't, we unfortunately can't fund online programs. Um, there can certainly be an online component if there's one or two classes that you can take um, online, but the majority of, of your program work should take place um, at a physical location. Um, they 
in the United States. There are a handful of institutions that have um, programs where you spend some time overseas. I'm thinking of Johns Hopkins SICE that has their Nanjing and their Bologna programs. Um, those are okay as long as the master's degree that you're receiving is from the US institution and the funding award that we provide um, we are able to pay to that U.S. institution. Um, the types of programs that we'll fund are ones that I've mentioned already, international relations, public policy, public affairs, business administration, management, um, anything that is uh, kind of general. We can't fund uh, uh, JD programs or joint degree joint degree programs that last more than two years. Again, we're really looking at that two year mark and curriculum that is um, in an area of relevance to the foreign service because law degrees have very structured curriculum um, with a purpose of getting folks into practice law, we're not able to fund those programs. Um, we're also not able to fund more technical programs. So let's say you're really interested in, in global public health, we're not able to fund that specific type of program, but we could fund a public policy degree with a, a concentration on international public health. So there are lots of different ways that you can make this work, even if you do have technical interests. Um, uh, but again, the programs themselves have to be broad and they have to also include a substantial amount of internationally focused um, uh, coursework. And then again, you will have to be attending full time and you will have to maintain a 3.2 GPA during the course of the time that you're in the program. And I mentioned our graduate programs already. If you do have questions about those, feel free um, to let us know. And just to highlight, um, you do have to apply to the graduate program separately. Our application process is just for the fellowship. All fellows who are awarded the program will still have to apply to the graduate programs in um, their own separate process. Our fellows begin their journey with the Pickering Fellowship um, in an intensive week-long orientation. This is really where we get started on um, the additional clearances. So I mentioned that during the selections process, we collect information to start the, the security clearance process. During the orientation, um, our fellows start their medical clearances. So they'll do their medical exams at the State Department clinic, um, get any tests that they need to get done there. Um, in addition to the clearances, we also do lots of professional development activities. We'll do lots of writing, um, lots of meeting with uh, foreign service officers and Pickering fellows um, who are in the department now to give you a broad sense of the different career tracks. You speak with um, individuals in each of the five different career tracks. Um, and you have an opportunity to meet and connect with your mentors as well. Um, we spend a lot of time at the Department of State during this week-long orientation. Um, and and uh, the fellows really get a, a much better sense as to um, what a career in the Foreign Service looks like. Um, after the first year of graduate school, um, and actually during, I, I'll tell you now, our, our current um, group of fellows who just finished their orientation this June are currently working on their domestic internship applications. Um, they will apply to their domestic internship the summer before they um, are scheduled to do so. Um, they will submit their applications um, as they're, they're getting ready to start their first year of graduate school. Um, after their first year of graduate school, during that summer in between the first and second year of grad school, uh, our fellows will do a 10-week internship at the State Department here in Washington, D.C. Um, they serve in lots of different offices, lots of different bureaus doing um, really interesting and, and um, compelling things related to foreign policy, related to regional issues, lots of different things. This is a really good opportunity for our fellows to learn more about the different career tracks, about what the different um, offices and bureaus are responsible for, and how Washington, D.C., um, the State Department at Washington, D.C. operates. Um, in addition to their internship, their, uh, the core, which is the core of the summer, we also schedule lots of different professional development opportunities and network networking events throughout the, the course of the 10 weeks that they're here um, as, an, as a way to get them acclimated to the different skills and um, opportunities within the department. Uh, following the second year of graduate school, after the fellows graduate, um, they start. They do their 10-week overseas internship. So as soon as they graduate, they hop on a plane and they go to uh, an embassy or consulate um, anywhere around the world. Not anywhere. There are a few restricted locations where they can't serve, but almost anywhere. We have folks in um, Yangon, Myanmar. We have folks in, um, uh, in Senegal. We have folks in um, Yaoundé, Cameroon. We have folks in Rio, um, Brazil, all over the world, really. 
And essentially this internship is another opportunity um, to really get a sense for how the, the department operates. The domestic internship um, really helps fellows get a sense of how the Washington DC offices operate. And the overseas internship gives them an opportunity to uh, get a sense for what it is that they're planning what that they'll get into once they are um, serving as foreign service officers overseas. Um, it's 10 weeks. Um, they are uh, allowed, the interesting thing about the summer as well that I'll mention is that our, um, our fellows are coming into posts and offices at a time during the summer when, the, when there's lots of transition. So the type of work that our fellows are doing is really um, what uh, early career foreign service officers are involved in. So um, both of the internships are, are, are really good opportunities to, to come into the service prepared for what to expect as a foreign service officer. So uh, as I mentioned, assuming that um, our fellows meet all of the, the different required requirements that are required of them, um, meeting and obtaining and maintaining those security clearances and medical clearances, and then also um, checking the boxes on the um, requirements that they have to, that all foreign service officers have to do, the foreign service officer written, uh, written test and the oral assessment. Um, then they enter the State Department Foreign Service after they complete their overseas internship. And they do lots of really interesting things as foreign service officers. Um, and they fulfill their five-year service obligation. I will say that a good majority of our Pickering Fellows are still in the department serving as um, foreign service officers. Just this last year, we had our first ambassador, um, confirmed ambassador to Moldova, and he's already um, working with uh, Pickering Fellows on the ground. We have um, two Pickering Fellows who are uh, currently interning in, in that post this summer. And the, you know, the, the career is a, a really um, interesting one. If you are a person who likes into is intellectually curious, who likes to um, change the type of work that they do pretty consistently. This is this is the career for you. Um, really gives you an opportunity every two years to uh, change up what you're doing, learn a different part of the world, um, and implement all of the skills that you learn during your course of graduate school and your internships. So, how to apply? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the logistics of what we need from you in order to consider you um, for the application, to consider you for the fellowship for the 2020 fellowship. Um, we do require a 600 word personal statement. We also have an additional 400 word statement of financial need. We'll request two letters of recommendation, one from a faculty or instructor, um, a as well as a community leader, which essentially means someone who has um, someone who can speak to who you are outside of the academic um, realm. So we want to see both the academic side of who you are as well as um, maybe more broadly what your interests in international affairs and career interests are. Uh, we'll ask for uh, your proof of citizenship, which is either your birth certificate, a uh, copy of your passport photo page, or, um, or your certificate of naturalization. We'll also request a student aid report generated by the FAFSA. You will need to, uh, to obtain a student aid report even if you've been out of school for a while, even if you graduated five years ago, we will still need a student aid report from you. Um, the one for 2019-2020 academic year is still available. Um, you would need to fill that out. I would encourage you to do that as quickly as you can. Um, the closer you get to the application deadline, um, the, the harder it is to, co to confirm that you'll get the student aid report in um, by that 17th deadline. We'll also request your financial aid award letter or statement from your senior year if you received one. Um, if you are currently in school and uh, you are in your last year of school, um, I would strongly suggest getting a copy, a PDF copy of that financial aid award letter just so that you have it on hand for our application, but just in general, because you will, if you come back to apply to other fellowships or graduate schools, they will ask for that information as well. We'll also, <clears throat> excuse me, request transcripts from all of the colleges and universities you've attended. Um, just to make a quick note, um, the I, I did mention that we can calculate cumulative GPAs. We can only do cumulative GPAs with institutions where you've attended for a year or more. Um, so if you just spent one year over uh, in a study abroad program, for example, um, that would not be enough for us to consider those uh, coursework 
uh, grades into your cumulative GPA um, if it's not already calculated on your undergraduate transcript. Um, but we will still request that information um, for that semester or couple of semesters that you spent um, at another institution. So please do remember to submit all of the transcripts um, from any universities or colleges that you've attended. And then we do have a space for the GRE and GMAT scores. They're not required, they're optional. Um, so uh, you don't have to submit them if you have not taken them. Um, I would strongly suggest that you uh, you take them, at, you sign up to take them um, because many of the graduate school applications will um, close in early January and uh, getting a date during the, the holiday season can be a little bit tricky. So, tricky. so um, even if you haven't taken the GRE or GMAT, uh, definitely would encourage you to sign up to take it. All of the materials do need to be submitted by September 17th, 2019. You'll get lots of reminders from um, us uh, to give you some tips on things to remember to submit. Um, but again, please try to get this in um, earlier, the earlier the better because everyone will be on the application system that evening of the 17th, making sure that everything's there and things might slow down. So I wanted to walk through just a couple of quick tips on uh, crafting a competitive application. Um, I know the first one sounds a little bit obvious, but sometimes it's not. Um, we do include uh, lots of dense language at different um, uh, places. Take a minute to read it. It is really important information um, for you to, to acknowledge what you're signing up for as by applying for the program. Read all the requirements. Make sure that you're eligible. If you have questions about your eligibility, if you have questions about whether or not your grad school programs are in line with what we would fund, I would strongly encourage you to, um, to get in contact with us and either send us um, your questions or give us a call. Um, we are happy to take phone calls at any point. Just let us know. Um, also, be sure to highlight in your in your statement, um, your personal statement. You have 600 words. It's not a lot, um, but it does give you enough space to highlight your motivations for applying um, to this particular program. Um, it is a State Department Foreign Service oriented program. So if we don't hear State Department or Foreign Service at all in your application, um, it might give our selection committee pause as to what your motivations might be for applying to the program. Um, again, we're really looking for, for people who have a strong interest in public service and international affairs. So those things should all be things that come out in your application um, personal statement. Um, you should also highlight any honors awards. They can be personal, they can be professional or academic um, and academic and any curricular, extracurricular activities that you've been involved in. I would also strongly encourage you to put down any leadership roles that you've had. So let's say you were a student club organizer um, and you uh, were with this organization for two years and you served in multiple different leadership capacities, write down all of those. Um, don't leave it to chance that our, our selection committee will assume that you held leadership positions. Make it explicit so that they don't have to, to read in between the lines. Um, also, emphasize your academic achievements and your abilities. The, the program is does require fellows to go through a two-year master's program, and many of the programs that our fellows attend are intensive and very academically rigorous. Um, so anywhere you can emphasize your academic achievements. And I do want to just note here that if you do not have um, a 3.9 GPA, that does not preclude you from being a competitive candidate. Um, our selection committee will also look at progression through your undergraduate career. So maybe those first two semesters, you thought you were going to be a pre-med major and that calculus and biochem class just kicked your butt. Um, that's okay. Um, because we'll look at the what you got in your major. Maybe you switched into a, a different major and you started to really excel. Um, that that that's fine. Um, again, as long as you make that 3.2 GPA, um, make sure that you're communicating to us that you are prepared to go into graduate school. Make sure that your letters of recommendation um, are strong, and this leads into the next point. Make sure that you're identifying people who can speak well on your behalf of your of of who you are and your potential for success in this area. I know that it sounds um, kind of funny. But you should get letters of uh, recommendation from people who like you. Um, you don't want. You, sometimes it's really hard to know what recommenders will say. You'll want to speak to to people who you'll know that can write strong letters on your behalf. Um, and if you are uh, kind of going back and forth between whether or not to get your direct supervisors. Um, 
uh, a letter from your direct supervisor or the person who had the big fancy title in your office, my suggestion is always to go with the person who speaks, who can speak more personally about um, your your experiences um, with them. Um, it adds a, a, a level of understanding of who you are um, that may not come through in um, from the person who uh, who who might be higher up but knows less about your your work. Um, also, uh, we do consider financial need. We have a lot of portions of the application where we ask for you to submit information about this. This is not for, for nothing. We do consider financial need um, in this process. Um, I'll remember to utilize those 400 additional words that you get in the financial need statement to the best of your ability. I would also strongly recommend that as you're getting folks to read over your personal statement, that you also have folks reading over your financial need statement. If um, we're looking at an app, if our selection committee is looking at an application and the personal statement is um, wonderfully crafted, no grammatical errors, really well done, and then the financial need statement is riddled with grammatical errors and typos, um, that may, might signal to the committee that um, there might be different issues with, with your writing um, that may not have been demonstrated in, this, in the personal statement. So again, make use of those 400 words and also make sure that um, you are proofreading um, the, the statements and every portion of your application. We'll ask for you to write things um, throughout your application, so make sure that you're presenting the best of, of who you are uh, throughout the application. So that ends my formal presentation. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions yet from um, the folks who have joined. Um, I do want to leave up the contact information though so that you do have um, a way to get in touch with us, pickeringfellowship at howard.edu. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. We are posting consistently throughout the week about updates with the application, um, opportunities to connect with us. Uh, go to our website, check out our events page. We have lots of um, opportunities to reach out to connect with us in person and online. Um, we are like I had mentioned earlier, happy to connect with you at any point. Shoot us an email, give us a call, shoot us a direct message on on um, on Twitter. We're happy to get back in touch with you. Um, and with that, unless we I come back and it appears we do not have any additional questions, um, I will look forward to being in touch with you and um, wish you the best of luck during your application.